this bill would require the PUC to develop and implement rules to conduct random annual facility checks to verify that providers of telecommunication service are in compliance with their plans submitted to and approved by the commission regarding backup electricity for telecommunications infrastructure. Um, this bill is also in the appropriations committee. Next is AB 3020. <clears throat> Uh, this bill upon appropriation uh, would require the Office of Planning and Research, OPR, to establish and convene the 211 Strategic Advisory Committee. Uh, the bill would also require the committee to be comprised of specified members. Um, that would also include uh, the director of Cal OES and other specified state agencies. <clears throat> that bill is also on the suspense file for appropriations. Uh, next bill I want to share is AB uh, 3090. The bill would authorize and encourage a public water system when updating an emergency notification plan to provide uh, notification to water users by means of other communications technology, including but not limited to text messages, email, or social media. Uh, that bill um, is, is in front of the Environmental Quality uh, Committee. Uh, next is SB 1003. Uh, this one would require electrical corporations to take into account both the need to minimize the risk of catastrophic wildfire as soon as possible and the amount of risk addressed for the cost of the proposed mitigation within the utilities wildfire mitigation plan. Also on this suspense file. Mm -hmm. And last but not least for the state bills is SB uh, 1220. Some may be aware of this one. Um, this one would uh, prohibit state and local agencies that are authorized to provide or enter into contracts that relate to a public uh, benefit program, including 211 um, and 988 services uh, from contracting with out of state call centers. The bill also would restrict the use of AI and automated decision systems <clears throat> that eliminate or automate the core job functions of a worker. That bill is also up in the appropriations suspense file today. Um, <clears throat> moving on to uh, just three federal bills that I want to uh, share with the group before I wrap up. First is HR 498. This bill would re require uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to undertake efforts to protect the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline from cybersecurity threats. The bill, um, the last action taken on this bill in Congress was um, March 6th. So, Next is HR 1353. This bill would require the FCC to facilitate the provision of emergency communication services, including 911 and emergency alerts in unserved areas. Um, in unserved areas uh, defined as one that has no commercial mobile service capable of providing emergency services because of a lack of infrastructure, uh, destruction of infrastructure, a power outage, or other reasons. And then last, lastly is um, HR 7043. Uh, this bill uh, would direct the FCC to issue reports after activation of the disaster information reporting system and to make improvements to the network out of reporting uh, for that system. And that was introduced in Congress um, in January of 2024. Can you see that? Um, that is the list of bills I wanted to share this morning. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, so that's the end of my report. Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. We appreciate that. Any questions from the board on that list of bills that we're tracking? All right, any questions online or from the public? Yes, one online, go ahead. Hey, online. budget. it's Budget Sherry. Um, I was just wondering if you might repeat, I didn't catch the bill number that you were talking about, something about out-of-state contractors. I think it was. Yeah, that yeah, one, go ahead. That one was. It's SB 1220, um, introduced by Senator Lamone. Might you read it one more time and just yeah, tell me what yeah, you no, said? Thank you. Yeah, no problem. 
So this bill, it would prohibit state and local agencies that are authorized to per provide or enter into contracts that relate to public benefits programs, including 211 and 988, uh, from contracting without a state uh, call centers. And it would also, so it's kind of twofold. It would, it would do that as well as um, restrict the use of AI. It would limit, it wouldn't totally get rid of it, but it would limit the use of AI and automated decision systems um, that that would eliminate or automate core job functions of a worker. Thank, yes. thank you so much. No problem. Yeah, and Sherry, that uh, will be in the list that we send out and make public. And for those of you that have never looked up the actual language of the bill, I would recommend you just you do a search for California legislature bill number. And then when you go in there, you can search by year as to what bill it is. Obviously, this is the current year we're in. And then the full text of the bill comes up. And really, you should rely on that full text rather than the summary uh, because it's just hitting the highlights. But just read through the entire thing. And that'll also give you the disposition of the bill. It'll tell you wh where it's at in the process, whether it's been voted on, which committee it's in front of, and all that is available on the uh, California legislature website that'll come up with that search. Awesome. Thank you both so much. Absolutely. All right. Any other questions from the public uh, related to item number four on the agenda? I'm sorry, item number three. All right. Thank you, Paul. We appreciate the update. We will get out that uh, uh, file to everybody. The next thing on our agenda is uh, item number four. This is our working group reports. You may recall we've condensed down to two working groups. Um, We've got representatives from each here in the room, so we'll start with the 988 and 911 interface working group. Jeff, if you want to take it away with your report, please go ahead, sir. Sure, thank you, Budge. Um, so uh, as members of the board are uh, aware of previous discussions, my working group was uh, tasked with developing guidance and protocols procedures for uh, when uh, certain types of calls made to 911 need to be transferred to 988 for better uh, handling and then vice versa um, the calls that are placed to 988 when they need to engage public safety services like law enforcement fire ems uh, and that's based on the the language in the bill uh, that talks about um, the, the objective of this board of creating one of many creating the the procedures for them uh, we've had several meetings uh, over the course of the last year, representatives from um, uh, various uh, interests uh, from the PSAP side or the public safety answering point from 911, uh, mental health, 988, uh, each giving their perspective. Um, so the draft uh, criteria that we have put together, presented, have been posted, uh, I believe, Budge, right on the website. Uh, it, 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 so really what it's hitting on, and I'm not going to go line by line, but I'll answer uh, questions and uh, receive feedback. Uh, the idea was to, as we know, um, uh, several calls are placed to 911 because of the public's familiarity with 911 when assistance is needed. Uh, someone is uh, suffering, uh, suffering from a behavioral health crisis or other uh, mental health related issue. Um, family member calls 911, says my my loved one or my neighbor, whoever it is, and I need assistance. The idea is this guidance would allow um, peace apps to better understand this would be a, a criteria or a situation based on the information provided that could be uh, better appropriately handled by 988 and then maybe follow on services like mobile crisis response team, etc. Uh, and so the the proceed the draft procedures that I'm presenting to the group. Um, for discussion and questions uh, are the culmination of the input from all those various interests that were participating in the work group. Some of uh, my fellow board members here also uh, participate in the work group. Uh, so the idea is that guidance that allows that 911 dispatcher to get the information based on the information they're provided by the caller and that they're able to obtain from the caller, make an assessment, would this be most appropriately handled by 988 uh, performing a transfer connecting to uh, uh, 988 and then um, uh, passing along that caller to 988 for better handling. Uh, and that's really the approach we were going for here. So with that, um, I, I would throw back to you, Budge, on if you want me to um, 
answer anything specific or if the uh, appropriate for the board members to have the discussion or ask questions and and then i'd be interested in receiving further guidance for the board on how we might be able to refine this into a uh, actionable um, proposal for uh, voting as a subsequent meeting yeah so i one additional thing that has happened um, that document was posted online the state agencies got together took a look at those protocols we got some pretty um, in-depth feedback, some additional edits were made. I did pass those back on to the committee uh, for them to, to consider. Uh, keep in mind that um, the authority that Cal OES has in this space to publish that is, is somewhat limited. This board might have, um, is a recommendation board, so obviously the board itself can't set policy. It can just make recommendations, so we're trying to stick with what we've done in the 911 space, we recognize clearly that 911 centers um, operate based on guidelines provided by the state, and generally all of them operate similarly. But there are some unique differences. So we're not trying to make this as prescriptive as, say, the EMD protocol that's developed by um, emer emergency medical dispatch that you do uh, over the phone. It's not going to be that prescriptive of a protocol that we do. The intent is to take this guideline document, give it to the PSAPs, and from there they would develop their individual, feed this right in their individual operational procedures that they manage at the local level. <clears throat> Similarly, 988 centers would take the same thing. They would take this document, fold it into their procedures they have at the local level. Um, that's the approach we're taking. So, but we have given all that feedback that we received from the state agencies back to the board. Um, we, we certainly will make all that public after the board reviews it. I think the next step is for them to produce their final version of the document, that to come back to this board and for us to vote on that uh, the next time that we meet uh, in August. Um, so that's kind of where we are in the timeline. But I want to make sure that we give everyone on the board an opportunity to comment as that draft document, essentially, you know, the, the feedback we've given has changed a couple of words around, but the the general flow of the document is unchanged. So what other input do the board members have uh, based on your review? That document's been out there for over, a, I think it's been out there three months uh, for up, up in the public space. So any other board members have any comments on that? Go ahead. Um, so the uh, the AEA working group reviewed it, and we have some feedback. So I can give that now, or I can give that in yeah. our work group. Now would be great. Okay. Yeah, we want to do everything in the wide open. That's the purpose of the meeting. So go for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the so our working group was very appreciative of the opportunity to, to support this important protocol. We thought the draft was quite strong. We thought the verbiage examples were especially helpful, and and kind of. Uh, visualizing for the 988 operators and the uh, PSEP dispatchers on, on how this would actually look like in, in practice. Uh, a couple pieces of specific feedback. Um, so one is around the, the phrase, quote, person has a weapon, end quote. So that appears in a, in a couple of times, but it's, it's not very clearly defined. And so there may be differing definitions um, of, of what weapon is or if there are situations with there someone is in a kitchen and there are knives there um, in the case of miles hall for whom california state 988 bill is named after he was had been outside working with plants in the yard and was holding a gardening tool which had been considered a weapon by the dispatch and responding officers um so i guess if, if there can be more clarity and specificity about about what a weapon is or when something becomes a weapon uh, we also had some feedback on possible unanticipated consequences on the following item. Well, person known to be wanted by law enforcement for the commission of a violent crime that poses a threat to public safety. Um, so we understand that this is trying to help um, support public safety. Um, our concerns was that it is a bit unclear logistically how this would happen, how 988 um, centers would know that this this was the case and also the this, the perception that it may give to the public that there's a background check being run or that this is not as a, a confidential service. And so if more specificity or um, um, definitions could be provided there. Um, and then I guess the, the last item is, is, is more for the board, um, but, and I, I hear, heard what you just said, Budge, but if, there are going to be many cases where there will be nuance or it's something that will not be addressed specifically 
in this in this protocol or uh, perhaps a more rural county or a county with with um, separate needs from many of the other counties may not have everything it needs to, to implement this type of thing and how this board or the agency might be able to support whether through consultation or trainings or some sort of other um, helping implement best practices. Thank you. All right, so I think on I have a couple of follow ups um, maybe for you, Jeff, you're more familiar with this. Um, the reference to violent crime was that when 911 received the call and was making a determination to move it to 988 or was that reference when 988 received a call and was trying to move it over to 911? You know? that, re that reference was when 988 receives a call. Uh, and you're talking about the uh, persons who are wanted by law enforcement and, and currently pose. Yeah. So the intent of the discussion there was what happens when 988 receives a call, somebody seeking uh, services through 988, but then it becomes, um, uh, they become acu acutely aware that this individual is somebody who's wanted and still poses an immediate or imminent threat to public safety. So one of the discussions in our working group that came up was this was around the time, some may recall a few months ago, uh, back east, there was a prisoner who escaped from prison. Uh, he was engaged in, he had, it stole a rifle from a house. He engaged in um, uh, acts of like uh, carjackings, et cetera. So posing a, a, an existing public threat. Threat. And I just use that as an example of what happens when that individual calls 988. What kind of liability could be put on the 988 center feeling like, well, we can't tell law enforcement. Now, from my perspective, working for law enforcement agency, I'm not saying we should compel the 988 center to let law enforcement know. But if they don't, what ramifications could come later on for the 988 center who chooses not to? And so that was really the discussion and the and the point there. And that's why we we had put the, the discussion centered around the phrasing of and poses a threat to public safety. So not just the fact that they're wanted, but also current their 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 current actions, activities, status, whatever uh, immediately poses a threat. Yeah, so I guess from the from your the working group discussions you had was the concern more that preserving confidentiality and and making it clear that 98 is a confident confident you know there is a uh, there's there's no one looking up records or not doing backgrounds on anybody was that more the concern or was it more along the lines of what Jeff is saying that if the 98 counselor discovers this situation where you know clearly probably some assistance from law enforcement is needed because of what's disclosed by the caller, and then they're allowed to take action. I think that's kind of the the sense of where they were coming from. Yeah, and you guys seeing kind of the different sides of the coin you're looking at. So I think I think we're fairly aligned. the The perspective our work group had was that the dangerousness of that situation would be picked up by the other criteria versus the warrant piece, because someone okay. could have a warrant for you know missing appearing in a court or other really kind of minor things and that that piece about having a warrant could be really discouraging for people who might otherwise really benefit from the service yeah so maybe jeff your working group could take a look if you struck the verbiage about the warrant does it change the intent I of that i don't think the verbiage oh. says warrant sorry it's a wanted, it by law wanted yeah yeah so yeah. a warrant obviously would be issued by a court of law and so that would be a different and that's why we didn't say that because you rightly point out that there are many people with many warrants for various crimes, and they they don't necessarily in of itself pose a threat to public safety. So when we said wanted, it's because they are currently uh, under investigation or the law enforcement agency has probable cause, um, and, and then again tying it to the, uh, the 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 threat to public safety. So. Um, yeah, there is no, I just checked again, there is no mention to warrant. That was my mistake. Yeah, that, and, and that's okay. Um, and and I agree that maybe even better clarifying wording could help with that understanding so others have an understanding of what that means. Yeah, so when you take a look at this next yep. round of feedback, see if that part is removed, if the intent is still there. Mm -hmm. And then I think it would satisfy both criteria. Yeah. You know, and then maybe even consider putting in the policy that, you know, something very, um obvious that nothing in this policy is intended to circumvent you know the confidentiality that exists when you call 988 right it, that, that's that's not the intent of this policy um 
if everyone reads that part, they would maybe feel better. I know most people won't read the whole thing. If you're like me, you read the first couple of words and you move on. So, <laughs> but yeah, okay. Any other uh, conversation or comments on that? I, I think the how will this be implemented part, um, a lot of that uh, clinical and operational piece really is over with HHS and DHCS and the policy working group that's going on with the uh, implementation plan. And I think they'll address a lot of the, how do we train to this? So what we're trying to establish first is, here's what technology is capable of doing, which is an important thing to understand. Here's the general criteria that's established for how you move the calls back and forth. Okay, now from a policy and training and standards perspective, how do we put that into practice? And I think that's, that's work that is ongoing um, in this discussion. Okay, other conversations. Go ahead, Julia. Um, so yeah, our agency, Dee Dee Hirsch, had questions around this same line known to be wanted by law enforcement, just because this is not something that 988 counselors have ever investigated, nor have been expected to know. And we don't know if this is going to put some type of public expectation, like kind of like what um, he was referring to. Um, so, especially if we're talking about where calls come into 988 first before we reach out to emergency services if needed, there's just a lot of questions around this particular bullet point and what that looks like, just because that's that's not anything our counselors have ever incorporated in their process or like somebody known to be wanted. Yeah, and and uh, it, it's interesting that, that both of you hit on the uh, two topics that were of an extensive discussion within our working group. So um, like known to be wanted. Well, you have to know that. Well, how do you know that? The, the intent here, and this is where I think clarity in the wording might help, the intent here isn't to then turn the 988 counselor into an interrogator where they're having to collect this information uh, or determine whether they're wanted or not. It's just when it becomes known. So I, I'm sure in, in the interest of the board's time, I'm not going to bore you, but I can tell story after story after story of situation after situation that I think all would agree. Well, yeah, we can't like just ignore that, right? Uh, and then again, I'm concerned about the 988 centers then taking on the responsibility of later on, if something were uh, to happen, uh, uh, impacting the public safety, and then the question being posed, well, why didn't the 988 center notify law enforcement? Why why didn't they if they knew that information? And so that was really the intent, and I think that clarity and warning could, uh, could help with that. All right, any other discussions from the board? Uh, go ahead. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, we've really appreciated the very thoughtful discussion that went into this draft protocol. And I understand it is a living document that will um, take feedback from various community members as well as uh, state agencies. One of the things that Cal HHS would like to highlight is the communication about the timeline and the intent of implementing these guidelines from the state. Um, it's been reported to us that there's um, uh, various 9-8 centers are experiencing pressure from their local PSAPs um, to start taking behavioral health related 911 calls. Um, and though we understand that this is very much in a best practice and an intent of AB 988 um, to really um, provide services in the least restrictive uh, way possible, and I think it makes sense to think about ways that we can divert behavior health related 911 calls to 988. Um, we're still also building up the capacity to do so at 98 centers. Um, I think we did a back of the envelope calculation that even if we did 1% transfer of 911 calls to 98 centers, that represents 80% of the total volume of 988 contacts currently. <laughs> so, you know, obviously there needs to be a timeline to do this thoughtfully so that we don't overwhelm the capacity of the 98 centers. Um, and, and the thing to also highlight is that is AB 988 is not a state mandate to transfer calls from 911 to 988. And I think that communication needs to be clear 
But when you mentioned that when the state provides guidance, the 911 PSAPs uh, really work to adhere to that, of course, with local variations, and they do have their individual capacity to um, establish their own um, regulations or however they do things. It, it is important when the state does issue guidelines because there is an intent to it. And if we can be really clear about what the eventual intent is without the urgency that has to be done now, I think that is something that we've been hearing back from the community, the sense of urgency that the state is saying that this must be occurring. So I think if, if we can really work on making sure that it's it's clear what 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 is now and and what is the eventual timeline. Now there's going to be a draft implementation plan coming from the Cal HHS Policy Advisory Group fairly soon within the next four months. Um, so I think that we can certainly make that clarification known when that implementation plan is public. But in the meantime, I think there is confusion that we're hearing back. Yeah. So um, I don't think. This board is yet contemplated of when the policy would be effective, and I think that's the sense of your question. Uh, we're more looking toward the implementation plan to help with that. But I do think that if this board can agree on a policy, then it will help us to understand how many calls might be moving back and forth, which then drives staffing models and local operation plans, because any guidelines we produce, um, our experience has been there now needs to be discussion at the local level for how do we implement this? How do we train to this? And when are we required to implement it? And I think that's kind of the exact point that you're making. So maybe we'll start the document with that. So, um, you know, we'll let the working group continue on the, the, the meat of the document. And then um, if anyone has any recommendations on the first part, um, go ahead, Jennifer. Um, I was just gonna say, I know, I know we don't want to rush getting this information out, but at the same time, now that it's been almost a year that 988's been ro rolled out, I know a very large organization in my county had a lot of public pressure to start the transfer process. Lon is very aware of this. Um, so they are creating their own guidelines, um, which are minimal to start, but I know as a PSAP, no one wants to be the first and we want guidance, but also now we're starting to see that the public wants this. So I think getting guidelines out that are reasonable um, and making sure they are known as guidelines, but it gives us all some place to start based on, I mean, our working group has like a good um, spread of people and knowledge, right? Contributing to this versus it, just myself as a 911 center going, we will do X, Y, and Z. There were things that from the mental health side, they were able to provide that I hadn't thought of. So I, I think we need to be mindful of that too, that people are going to start doing what they want without the, the whole picture thought of. So, so. Yeah. So I think we'll add to the beginning of that document, something about the intent of the document, um, mention of the timeline to implement and, and the fact that it's a guideline and that you know, training and local procedures will need to be developed. We'll certainly frame it up as that. And that starts to get some information out there. And then I think once, and this is just, you know, the way we are as, as humans, once it becomes something that people are like, oh, wait, this is probably actually going to happen someday. Let me really think about this. Um, and then we start to get some really good feedback, like, hey, did you think about this and think about that? So go ahead, Lon. Just so folks know, the the volume has gone silent uh, for those who are listening remotely. 
Okay, well then. <laughs> when That's I first said before. <laughs> But but but, but I, I I think the 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 quick you know um, um, recommendation is that the sooner that that we can provide any sort of guidance and guideline, the better it helps with the local no one and everyday collaborations and and doing the call transfer and so on. Yeah. So for those that missed the the summary there, um, uh, the state has a process and a timeline and a plan that does not always align with the pressures that's being applied at the local level to do some of these things. And, and certainly we appreciate that. So we'll move as quickly as we can, um, but it, it'll be August before we're able to formally vote on this because uh, it's not on today's agenda. Um, but we can um, uh, republish that update the next time you meet Jeff with these changes we've discussed. We'll get it out there and then I would encourage um, comments on that and then at the next meeting, let's come prepared to to vote on that. Um, there there are many ways to provide feedback, um, but you know during that meeting, we certainly can put the document up live and and go through it. But we we agree that that it does need to be out there and and published. So go ahead, Julian. You had something else to share. Yeah. So I do have a question. Um, so our agency has a lot of like line specific feedback reordering of bullets. I wasn't sure what the best way is to like submit this or discuss them in a public way. Um, and we could be here for like half an hour <laughs> if I went through it verbally now. So I guess some more guidance on like some of the general themes are some verbiage seems to be a little vague, uh, such as like description of serious criminal activity when it's recommended to reach out to law enforcement. Like that seems like a lot of gray area. And there are some words that would need to be further clarified, maybe by a clinical group such as suicide in progress and like injury to self, because suicide in progress could look different ways if someone maybe took a couple pills but stopped versus someone has like their means accessible right then and there but have not acted on them and like injury to self could be misconstrued as self-harm which can be a coping skill and not necessarily you know an attempt in progress so there's yeah we have a lot of line specific feedback so i'm curious what is the best way to submit any written commentary I would imagine you could just email them to me and then I can make it part of the discussion for the working group. Um, uh, obviously, the the process is a collaborative one, so different voices. And it's interesting that the comments that I'm hearing here are the probably some of the discussions that took the most time in our working group. So obviously, you know it's it's resonating within our working group and and with you all and and looking at it. So like, serious crime and originally I had said felony crimes well that really doesn't mean much to somebody outside of law enforcement how how does uh, somebody in the mental health community distinguish what a felony crime is and and, and so you know um ultimately it comes down to I'd be happy to take that feedback uh, via email especially if it's lengthy or we can have a uh set up a meeting where we can discuss those through and I can present it to the working group but I want to make sure that the product that I'm continuing to present to this board is a, a cumulative work from all voices and not just from uh, you know one side or the other uh, which it has been up to this point and I think it will continue to be um, and then I one of the concerns I do have is making it too specific too narrow um, especially when looking from the 911 perspective when a dispatcher receives a 911 call they are having to do a quick triage and making an assessment as to what best resources will be applied to this individual's uh, the the information that the individual is presenting. So if somebody says they've taken some pills, as a dispatcher, I'm not making a determination of how many pills or whatever. I need to engage medical services because I have to assume the worst. This is just one example, and so I am a little concerned about. <clears throat> um, 
making the protocol so narrow, so defined that it starts to limit the emergent decision making necessary on the PSAP side. Yeah, and, and whatever policy this board sets will not be overly, well, this board can recommend whatever they want, but whatever OES ends up doing can't be overly prescriptive for two reasons. Our statutory authority doesn't allow us to tell the specific center how they're going to do a specific thing. That's not in the statute. So we have to be mindful of that. And furthermore, we have to respect the fact that there are some differences. There are places in California where you can call 911 and they will dispatch a deputy to your house and change your light bulbs on your front porch. You're not probably going to be able to do that in Los Angeles Police Department with their 911 center. So there's just some differences. So what we would say would be warranting calling 911 differs across the state. We appreciate that. We don't get into the weeds there. We, what we do say is somebody does call, you should answer in this amount of time. You need to have this many folks there to answer these calls. And here's the technology to facilitate that. It's kind of the role that OES plays. So in this, if there's ambiguity in there, uh, in the document, certainly meet with the working group. Uh, the working group can invite you to come and present that. It's totally allowable as well, a one-on-one, face-to-face. -on -one, -face. Then you'll hear how those comments are adjudicated and worked through so that it can percolate up to something that could be applied to all centers. And that's really what we're trying to do through this board. Um, and so certainly please reach out to Jeff, get in the feedback, um, and that goes to anyone that's looking at this document in detail. And then we'll rely on the working group to come to a consensus-based model that comes back before this board as a recommendation. And then when you're sitting on this board, put on your board hat that says, hey, for the good of California, this is what this policy will be uh, to help everybody. And then when it gets implemented at your local agency, you certainly can be much more prescriptive on this word means this thing, which is in compliance with this guidance. And here's how we're going to implement this locally. That's sort of the, the flavor that we're um, that we're looking for here. Um, it's, since it's come up a few times, I'm wondering, I would, I would like to hear opinions if 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 it is possible. Should there be a definition section in this? Would that be helpful to maybe clarify some of these statements where you just have a glossary of definitions? I think it would be helpful, especially if there's already a definition in state statute for what that term means. Right. Okay, we will see if we can incorporate that because I think it might address some of these questions that are posed by people when right. they read it right. and, that, and they come up. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Any other uh, discussion from the board? All right. Any other discussion online? There's two. Okay, go ahead to who? Sherry, go ahead. Thanks, Budge, and thanks to everybody for the opportunity to talk through some of these important policy decisions. Uh, Antu, I appreciate your comment about um, the timeline, and I, I do think that that's important. Um, we, you know, being in LA, we have a lot of PSAPs in our community, and and some are very eager to implement, um, and we don't want to lose that energy and that that momentum, but it's also challenging when not everything is in place and including capacity. We actually even had one PSAP who came to us and said, oh yeah, we've already started transferring you calls from 988. And we didn't know about it and had discussed no protocols. And so I'm wondering if a piece of this policy might be that there should be uh, an MOU or some sort of agreement um, between the 911 PSAP and the center prior to actually beginning the work and doing the work to make sure that there are some policies that are being, um, uh, you know, adhered to. Um, that's my first comment. I also have a second comment, um, which is, um, I also appreciate that the comment about the, the person being wanted and whether or not a center might be liable if they don't report something. Um, you know, centers do already uh, report if somebody's life is in immediate danger. Um, and I, I do think that adding that additional clarification, I, I'm wondering if it, if wanted even needs to be in the language because if a person's life is in immediate danger, whether the potential person who's, who's at, you know, at risk for completing that behavior is wanted or not is probably not important. And I do, I do fear that, um, you know, we might start to 
infringe upon the trust of this of this uh, system as a tool for people in crisis if they think or see language where we might be, you know, making reports of somebody is wanted or even in the language about a person being wanted for a felony or any language about being wanted for anything to me seems out of line with the, the work that we're trying to do to support somebody in crisis, especially if we're trying to minimize, um, you know, intrusive interventions and potentially dangerous interventions and really work towards a collaborative solution to things, it feels like that's hiding anxiety, heightening anxiety and could have the opposite effect. OK, thank you for that feedback. I uh, appreciate that. All right, any other um, and and we one of the things we I'm, I'm thinking of is I'm unaware of any statute that gives the state authority to mandate an MOU be in place. So I don't know we'd be able to go that far. Um, however, nothing would preclude, preclude you at the local level from entering into that agreement. I just don't know that we have uh, statutory authority to do that. We do have statutory authority to, to do regulations. That's a whole nother process, a multi-year process, by the way. Um, so that's I, that's something that, that could be explored. And certainly Budge, your comments. We, oh, I was so, just wondering, Budge, could we put something like, you know, have conversations with your with your local, you know, that the party should have conversations before actually implementing transfers? Or I don't know if we're able to do that. The the challenge with that is, and this is something you have to think about in policy. If you don't have a conversation and then you do transfer, what happens? Right? So we don't want to set a policy where if you haven't talked to a center, you can never transfer to them, which would be the unintended consequence of something like that being put in a policy. So we we just you just have to think through all of the possible iterations of this. What this in is intended to do is if you receive a call, you think it's not for you. Here's some guidelines to determine if you should send this to 98 if you're a 911 center, vice versa. If you receive a call in 98, you think it should be 911. Here's some guidelines for you to consider as you develop your local policy to push this to 911. That's what this document is at this sure. point. Yeah. Well, or maybe even just a statement encouraging people that, you know, these processes work more smoothly when there's, you know, planning in place. I Because I understand, of course, if somebody's in crisis or vice versa, we don't want to limit that. But anything to encourage people to actually communicate with each other before starting this, I, I think would be great if there's a way to fit that in. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Uh, and then there's one more comment online, two, a couple more. So who's next? Who is? Alec, you're next. Go ahead. Thanks, Budge. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Alec Smith, and I work on the 988 program at the Department of Healthcare Services. Uh, this is my first time joining this meeting, so I might be repeating a few things that you guys are all aware of or bringing to your attention things that have been previously covered. Um, but DHCS Upper Management has reviewed the proposed 911-988 transfer protocols, and they just had some feedback they wanted me to share, which I'm pretty sure I'm repeating a lot of uh, stuff that's been said here today already. Uh, but DHCS considers this guidance more of a framework and less of a mandate. Uh, we also expect that the LEMSAs, PSAPs, and 98 LCCs will uh, continue to develop and implement pertinent policies and procedures to appropriately transfer contacts between 911 and 98 using this document as a guide uh, rather than these protocols being set in stone. Uh, we expect this to be uh, most useful to guide rather than dictate. Um, and DHAS would also uh, expect the policies and procedures around this coordination to evolve through a, a QA and QI process from both the LEMSA and the 988 LCC side. And implementation and administration of 988 in California will, will certainly continue to evolve. Uh, it sounds like the board's on the same page with this, but they, uh, they just want me to share DHAS's feedback up to this point. Okay, and we've got that in the recording, Jeff. So there were some good words for you to consider putting it also the starting to type but yeah, yeah beginning of your document because i yeah. think that was well said thank you alec for that input um we appreciate that comment all right and yeah, then no i problem. believe there's one more for lizanne uh dr wick go ahead all right oh good i thought maybe my hand was invisible um I, I was it's sure it's invisible to me but not the person running the board so go ahead <laughs> um, uh just lightly touching back on uh danger to others or danger to the public. Um, typically, most crisis centers, including wealth-based, um, our focus is imminent risk to life, you know, 
by suicide um, and not any legal woes that the individual may have or be making unless it's a terrorist off warning about um, danger to a specific person or, or group of people um, that are identifiable. Um, and that's that's already a mandate, you know, not not. You know, uh, law or whatever, but I mean, there's already a mandate nationally for that, I think. Um, and uh, and otherwise, no, we don't even consider that or, or even want access to that information as far as, you know, do they have a warrant or are they wanted or whatever. Um, and then on the um, cold, what I call cold patches, um, we sure don't like those. Um, <laughs> and uh, the thought of many PSAPs or even a handful of PSAPs doing that across California is really frightening. Um, because one, um, we lose the ability, if need be, in a life-threatening situation, um, to be able to, you know, locate that person once it's transferred to us. And that may be worked out with um, OES's wonderful platform. Um, that may change. But current state, no, we lose traceability. Um, and the other part of that is we lose critical information about who it is that's on the phone, what their phone number is, um, and uh, what what is known about suicide. And there are currently some jurisdictions that um, are doing cold patches. And we're only finding out because the caller tells us, well, I called this person, this agency first. Um, and it's, re it's really problematic. So. If there's a way through maybe best practices, not because the technical advisory said board said so, but maybe through a list of best practices that we can weed out the cold batches, that would be really a primary thing to do. Okay, so the second reference um, to the cold transfer, this is where call comes into a 911 center. It's determined it's for 98. You blind transfer is the term that 911 uses. You just Push it to 98 and hang up before they even answer. That is that is not reflected in the policy. The policy or the guideline is very clear that there should be a warm handoff, yeah. and that is spelled out in the guideline. So um, we do think that's an important part of this, and that is already in the document. Awesome. Yep, absolutely. Okay, any other questions or feedback on this? All right, this is going to be a, an important topic at the next meeting. Um, so um, really look forward to the good work that Jeff's group is going to be doing. No pressure, but this is uh, this is important. And as you can see, a lot of folks are interested in this. Um, if you have any questions on when the working group is meeting and you want to meet directly with the working group, that's certainly allowable. You can certainly go through Samantha, whose point of contact is on the slides. And she'll let you know when the next working group meeting is. I think some of these conversations would be better facilitated face to face down at that working group level. Come up with a document that's in agreement, and that'll help us when we're in this forum. All right. The second working group we need to report out on is the accessibility and equal access working group. So um, I think Dr. Bowie, you're going to be reporting on that. So go ahead, or maybe not. Thank you very much. Um, since the last meeting of this board in November, the Accessibility and Equitable Access Working Group has met four times. I'll quickly cover the first two, and Dr. Yuan will, uh, Rafael Yuan will cover the second, the most recent meetings. Really, the major message from this work group is um, that they are eager to accomplish specific tasks that would be assigned by the board. We're asking for work from you, uh, <laughs> so. Give us some work. Um, we are eager to be involved across the various work groups to support accessibility and equity consideration. So we're happy to get some assignments. Uh, to that end, we are very grateful um, to the interface and, and 911 uh, working groups um, to invite our participation in the protocols uh, transfers that we've just discussed and, and took uh, feedback and, and allowed us to, to participate. We're very happy about that. Um, in November, there was new leadership, so you may remember that Dr. Goldman had moved out of state and then uh, Stephanie Welch had to step off. That's why I'm here and co-chairing the work group with Dr. Ralph Yuan. 
uh, we also did um, review some formative research from SAMHSA about um, communications on 988, and there's a very good set of guidance now from our national federal partners around public messaging about 988. Um, that's a good resource for us to reference. And then in January, we got some good uh, demonstrations. We got um, a DD Hirsch to present on uh, 988 imminent risk assessment and the interface between 988 and 911. So very much appreciate that uh, understanding and just want to uplift again that the majority of 98 contacts are resolved during the encounter itself and less than 5% of 988 contacts need an in-person response and less than 1% need emergency intervention. So I think that's always something for us to keep in mind. Um, I think that's it that I'm going to highlight in the interest of time. Let me hand it over to Dr. Rafael Yon. Uh, thanks, Antu. Um, so I have the opportunity to, to co-chair this, this, this work group. Um, so I'll provide some updates on our most recent two meetings. Uh, the one in February we had originally held um, focused on the uh, letter to the FCC. So this may be less relevant now that the FCC has come out with a, with a new, new rule. Um, but one 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 uh, point of feedback which might still be relevant is the need for clear terminology and explanations to the public on what geolocation based routing or geo routing is and how that differs from what 911's capabilities are and because more people are familiar with that. And we think that this will continue to remain uh, an important item. Uh, First, we saw a substantial amount of confusion around 98 having geolocation abilities when it first launched, when it, it didn't have any, you know, didn't have anything. And now that we'll have some level of capability, uh, that confusion is likely to increase, especially because even if we know the difference between geolo geolocation-based routing, uh, general public may not just assume that's the same thing. Um, and so one of the things to, to we would like to pose to the board here is if, if it would be appropriate comment for the board or the agency to provide to the FCC during the current open comment on the proposed rule. Um, and then moving to our most recent meeting, uh, so we covered a number of more future looking items. Um, so one is looking at our work group's representation to ensure that 98 remains an accessible and high quality service for, for everybody. Um, we're especially looking for work group members who can pr provide perspective and feedback on some of the specialized services that are already included in 98. So looking to expand our work group to include veterans, young people, specifically um, also Spanish language speakers, individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing, as we've had some work group members who've had to had to leave for various reasons, uh, tribal groups, disability rights communities, and others. Um, we're also appreciative of the opportunity to review the 911 98 um, interoperability draft. And then uh, the last thing that we wanted to update is so, um, as Antu had mentioned, some new reports to Congress have come out from SAMHSA, and then following this, Vibrant is putting out new requirements for all 98 centers. So not just in California, but these will also, of course be relevant here. Um, some of them are, are very interesting and, and useful um, or notable for, for our, our work group, and I think for the board at, at large, so I'm just gonna share a couple of them. Uh, one is that there are the centers um, now have new training requirements for crisis counselors and managerial staff to address what they're, they're calling the complex needs of 988 lifeline contacts with um, such as LGBTQIA populations, immigrant, migrant, undocumented communities, youth, ESL, um, BIPOC, tribal nations, indigenous and Native American communities. And so centers are required to create or take trainings to address these issues. So our work group is reviewing and discussing how we might support this and if there might be um, technical uh, support that's needed in the implementation of this. So we're especially um, appreciative to some of our agency partners on the work group for that. And then one other new important requirement, 98 centers shall ensure that continuous outreach and engagement plans are in place to recruit crisis counselors and managerial staff reflective of the communities they serve. This is also a development we will be following and um, is, is something that, that's kind of a, a, a new initiative or something that I'm, you know, ha hasn't been in place for 98 centers before, but it may help promote our goal to make sure that 98 is accessible and providing high quality services to all of the communities across California. Thank you again for this opportunity and just echoing with what Antu started with, we we'll continue to be available to provide support to other working groups and also invite the board to formally assigning or co-assigning um, uh, uh, 
work products, relevant work products to our group going forward. Thank you. All right, so your comments on uh, geo routing, we've got an agenda item later. I think we'll get into that a little bit more, uh, but I think for the board, is there any assignments that you have for the accessibility and equal access working group? Is there anything that you've come across that you want to specifically see if that working group can uh, help get some information or, or make, you know, do some research in support of what you're doing? All right. So something to keep in mind going forward. Absolutely. Yes. OK, um, yeah, go ahead, Aaron. I just had a question. Were they provided additional funding for these new requirements and training for their counselors? So right now, the um, the requirements are draft, uh, but it looks like it's very close to being the final version. I, I believe they're anticipated to release it in July, the final ones. Um, I'm not sure exactly how Vibrant is planning to um, pair financial support or, or um, provide that uh, parallel to these um, new requirements. But part of why these requirements are being expanded is that um, my understanding is that the last time that 98 centers had to sign a formal agreement policy, the last time that policy was changed was was multiple years ago. And now that there is federal funding um, support provided to centers, Vibrant and new requirements, Vibrant was looking to update that that lifeline agreement policy. All right, any other questions from the board on agenda item number four? All right, any other questions online? Okay, all right, let's move on to uh, agenda item number five. Um, this is an update from the uh, 98 system director and I'm serving in that capacity. Uh, these are the standing agenda items for that. I'm gonna move rather quickly through them. Um, and then pull out some of the key points, but happy to go into um, deep conversation um, at any point that you guys want. So I'm looking right at Kurt uh, Galat, who's our project manager for the state on this first one. Um, and, and really the effort that he's done to complete the testing with Vibrant um, that, that we've been talking about for quite some time. We completed that verified by Vibrant uh, in writing that we are fully compliant with um, all of the integrations for chats, texts, and calls, and everything that we've been asked to demonstrate, we've demonstrated in the lab, uh, including all the reporting that they need to demonstrate that what we're doing is in, uh, gives the data back to Vibrant and then ultimately back to SAMHSA to make sure that we're in compliant with the national requirements for administering the 988 system. So we're working on getting that written approval um, or, or just the head nod. We'll take anything from SAMHSA that gives us now the ability to roll this out. Kurt is um, working on a phased approach, hopefully beginning with a pilot site and then rolling out center by center. We do know and appreciate that not every center is at a position of capacity and training to immediately begin doing chats, texts, and calls on day one. That's the work and the phased approach that Kurt is, is working on. Once we get the green light to begin this process, we know it'll take a minimum of six months. And there are many moving pieces that make that six month a fuzzy uh, date. Um, centers have unique requirements. We will honor them. Uh, we will do our best to uh, do what we can to accommodate the realities that exist at the local level. Um, but if everything was perfect in a perfect world, which we know it's not, you know, there are many of you who are probably glass half full, glass half empty. I'm just happy to have a glass. I don't care what's in it. I know at some point it's something will be in it. So I'm a little more optimistic than most, um, but optimistically six months is the timeline. And, um, and we recognize there's going to be some unique things that we have to accommodate at the local level, and we will do that. So that is where we are. Um, we have uh, also demonstrated full interoperability with 911 in our lab, meaning that all that call flow we've been talking about since this board formed, we can do and, and can roll out. And so we see a dramatic improvement in our ability to really improve the workflow so that those answering these calls, whether it's on the 98 side or the 911 side, can really focus on doing what they need to do instead of worrying about what the technology won't let them do. Go ahead, Jennifer. 
So are you saying we'll be able to transfer text to 911 to 988? So that's a different challenge okay. because the way text comes in to the 988 system is different than the way it comes into the 911 system. So yes, under some circumstances, we can fully do that, but there are limitations depending on how you're receiving it and which side of that you're on. All right, so that's the one piece that needs a little bit more, but the calls, yes, absolutely. So transferring to 988 versus like a direct line to our local center? Correct, transfer, but it wouldn't be, don't think of it as transferring to 988 because we don't want to go send the, 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 the person seeking help back through the call tree at the national level. Mm -hmm. This is a direct transfer, similar to how you transfer to a neighboring PSAP, mm -hmm. you're transferring to a 988 center. Okay. They would know this is an incoming call from 911 on their call handling system. And any information that you're able to share we can send automatically with the call. Great. Right. So remember, when you've called 911, we already know where you are. So we're not trying to disclose anything that's not known, but there are certain rules as to how we share that information. We just have to be mindful of that. But aside from that, yes, we can move those calls. 988, the other way, if the caller disclosed their location, that will be sent. If they did not, then all you'll know is the center that took that call. And then you may have to go through an exigent circumstance type process um, until we get into this geo routing space that we're talking about. We the the short answer is we will not know the where the nine and eight caller is exactly. That's just not going to be known. Go ahead, Lars. So yeah, I, I, I there's some challenges about nine and eight and call routing and so on, and and I think. We at Nanade in Canada, Santa Clara, we had some early conversation with our local number one partners like uh, more than a year ago. And some of the concern was because of the, the call, um, the what you call it, the the um, um, the rollover calls. Uh, for example, if you know the concern is that if um, local number one agencies simply transfer to Nanade Day, uh, for whatever reason, then it is center not able to pick up that call within a minute or within a specified time. That call going to be rolled over to the next and it centers, which might be, um, you know, one of the center in the state or even out of state. So that was concern, and because of that, our local um, we uh, we did develop a a, a backline where our nine one one can just. Um, um, transfer calls to that so that it stay with us it doesn't go to whichever all the backup centers so and i think i brought up this concern be, before um uh, and might as well talk about it now because it's i think all the nana center will experience that anyway is is that when when that call is is going to be route to our uh, so called backup line in our local nana center is going to stay there and because of that if, if for whatever reason we can pick it up a call, our local number one can always take that call back and handle that themselves. But if it get call, if it get rolled roll over to a backup center and other centers, then they don't know what happened because of that. They will not want to uh, transfer call to 988. Um, so and 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 the concern with that is that when they transfer the call to our local line, our, our local back line, there isn't a way to know that that call was actually transferred from 911 to 98 because there is no tracking me mechanism for that because they transferred to our backline rather than 98. So then how do you how do you fix all of that stuff? So the good news on all of that, so if you're not tracking the scenario, let's say that you know Jeff is my PSAP and I'm a 988 center and Jeff is trying to send a call to me. Jeff's call queue has 200 calls in it and they're answering one call every 60 seconds and that's that's their pace so when they send that call to me as a 98 center i need to pick up in in a reasonable amount of time to facilitate this warm handoff that we've been talking about which is the best practice if i can't pick that call up then what we need to know from the state perspective is what do you then want us to do and at what time we can program that into the system if the best practice at the local level is if i don't answer within 30 seconds the 911 center takes the call back and handles that call because there's not capacity locally to handle it. We can do that. If the policy is, hey, if this 988 center is not available, 
Melanie's center will more be more than happy to handle that 988 call. And we roll from this one to that one. And then she picks up the call. We can do that as well. And you will know it's from 911 because of what we've built into the system. So that visibility will be there. Those are the kinds of questions that Kurt and his team and our vendor partner are going to ask you at the local level when we roll this out. And then we monitor it, we validate it, we iterate it. There's a feedback loop to see if there's any adjustments made. These are the exact questions that we're trying to get to and why this new technology is so important because it will give you visibility on what's really happening with these callers where now there's a slight delay in when you're getting feedback on, on what's really happening to the call. Go ahead, Jennifer. Um, I just want to clarify. So when the conversations ha happen at the local level, it's going to be customizable. Ha that's very cool. And, and can differ from region to region. Yes. Okay. It will. We know it will differ from region to region. Well, that's why I Absolutely. bring it up. Yeah, because yeah. you can't make a single. Yeah. And as good as Kurt is, he's yet to be able to tell the future and to be able to figure out what you need without you telling him. So we need those two pieces of data that we can get this done. And that's part of the process um, that, that he's going to go through at the local level. Yeah. And which is why we're so excited about this. Go ahead, Aaron. Do the PSAPs have input on this or is it? Absolutely. Yeah. The PSAPs will have input. Now, remember, though, there's a relationship in some cases. I think, Didi Hirsch, you, you probably set the record. 80 some PSAPs to one center. Um, well, no, I actually, I think Dr. Wick's area is even larger than that. She's probably got over 100 PSAPs to her one well, center. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, sorry, you, you, you've got the, the largest number. So, it is unlikely that every PSAP will tell us exactly how they want this done. But those that do communicate, we will. And that's why as the process rolls out, you'll be able to feedback with us to say, hey, this center is asking for this disposition. We can get that granular in the technology. It's just we know at day one we won't have all that information. But we we certainly can go down to the PSAP level. Yeah. Yeah. Budge, the, the testing you've been doing between uh, 911 and 988, is that taking into account both the legacy 911 and I3? It's, it's next-gen 911 that gives us the full power. Okay. Yeah. So – it will, How might that impact then we, the rollout? We can transfer to legacy 91 and back. That's been tested. But some of the capabilities and functionalities aren't right. quite as cool in that space as they are the next gen space. Okay. So we will not delay the deployment of one or the other waiting on each other. Just know that there are some differences. Do you foresee with some of those, uh, we'll call them enhanced features with I3 and next gen, do you see some operational or predict some operational limitations with legacy transfer? Yes, uh, namely the button you program to 988 won't have all the functionality the next gen button has. So on your console, you've got your legacy transfer to 988 programmed in as a 10 digit number right that 10 digit number would now go into this new call handling system and so we're moving in that direction um it it will behave very similar to the next gen world it's the other direction that things get much more different okay right our ability to route to a 911 center that's not on next gen cannot be done geospatially we have to fall back to the legacy method of doing that Right, because you can't geospatially route in the legacy right. 911 system. That's that's where the real difference happens. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's where we are with that process. The other thing on this slide, um, we did release a, a 988 mobile data um, dispatch solution, um, and we pulled that RFP back. There were some procurement updates that we need to to do. We will re-release that RFP soon. Uh, and we still expect contract award by the end of the summer. The next thing this board will have to talk about as we anticipate the implementation plan is who is actually going to do the dispatching? And the technology doesn't need to know the answer to that question today. We need to know what dispatch functionality looks like. That's what this technical plan does. But each of the centers that have access to mobile dispatch teams would need to make a decision of how that dispatch is going to happen and who who's going to do it. 
that's the next conversation we need to have. Um, and I would say, you know, we may even want to think about a little working group or maybe Jeff, after you're done, you'll just continue. And this might be task number two for you, but that's the next big question, right? And it's not, don't think that we're immediately creating a capability that's going to be implemented on August 1st. That's not what we're thinking. Just like we did with the call handling solution and the customer relationship management software, we're laying the groundwork so that whenever the operational decisions are made, you're not waiting on the technology, right? So once capacity is built, process is in place, technology is available. And that's the position that we're going to sit in for this. So I don't want to get overly excited, but that's kind of where we are. If we did it any other way, then you'd have to wait two years after you make your policy decision before I can get through a competitive bid process to actually get technology in place to support you. So we're trying to work parallel processes here and be as nimble as we can um, in this uh, great state of California that has many moving parts. All right, so any questions on uh, where we are with, with those two? And again, my, my thanks to Kurt and uh, Chris Delano from NGA, uh, their project manager. Those two have really been uh, what has gotten us to this point. So a lot of hard work from them. Really appreciate that. And the collaboration with the centers and the feedback that, that everyone that's been involved with um, this process has given has been really helpful. Okay. Um, I This slide is, is basically a placeholder. Um, just want to make clear that we are aware of what we're required to do legislatively. We have verified full interoperability between NextGen 911 and the 98 system uh, in April, and now we're at the point where we need to roll this out uh, to the field once we get um, approval to move forward on this particular task. The 98 surcharge, um, this is a standing agenda item. I don't have anything new since the last time we met. The next opportunity for the surcharge to change will be based on the budget that is approved in June. And then there will be an authorization and I'll, I'll just click to the next slide. This graphic shows our authorized budget. So we take that budget that were approved for 24-25. We will do a comparison with the number of access lines, calculate the math, and if eight cents is not enough to generate the revenue needed to support the budget, then we would change that eight cents to what is needed to support the revenue, the expenditures or authorization given in the budget. Uh, all of that happens and would be submitted to the Par Department of um, Fee and Tax Administration, CDTFA, in oct by October 1st, and then come January 1st, the fee would change. Uh, so we're still watching the details of the May budget. Um, May revised budget have not been released, so I don't have any insight if this is going to change yet. But that's what this graphic is for and kind of where we are in the process. And again, it's just some straight math calculation. That top line is what's authorized in the budget. You subtract out any. Um, balance that's in the statement, you multiply that by the number of access lines, and that's what generates the revenue needed to support the program. This can go up to 30 cents without um, any additional changes to the legislature. In other words, the budget process would authorize it going up to that amount. Uh, we can't do anything without authority um, in the budget, though. So that's kind of where the surcharge is. Nothing, nothing new there, but I'll, I'll keep reiterating that process. I know there's a lot of uh, uh, questions around that. This is just the 988 advisory board tasks. Um, so the one we've been spending a lot on is that third bullet, the creations of standards and protocols for when 988 centers will transfer to 988 calls to 911 and vice versa. This, this one little sentence hinges on the technology, the guidelines that Jeff's working group is working on, and the implementation plan that is being worked on by Cal HHS and DHCS. So all that will come together to make that a reality. And apologize if I went fast through that, but I know we've got a, an update we want to hear from uh, from Cal HHS. So as far as agenda item goes, number five goes, 
any questions the group has for the activities that that OES is currently working on from the board. Go ahead. Thanks for going through that. Um, I think at our last meeting that we we all sat down for, um, there was a, a number that was given to the amount of money that the, the, the fee had brought in um, per the year, and there was some, I don't know if reserves are the right word, but some amount that was there because it hadn't been spent yet. Has that process started? And I guess how much has come in like over the last year? What is that number looking like? Yeah, so this is the what's called the fund condition statement. And it shows the balance in the fund at the bottom of 22-23 is 22 million. 138,000 and that carries over into the next year as the revenue moving forward. The reason why there was a a balance there is because while we had the authority to spend, we didn't have the the BCP, the budget change proposal that outlined the specific budget for every agency to spend that revenue that was coming in. So you notice there's no authority to spend anything in that column, it's just purely revenue. The authority comes the next year where you see that um, the Cal OES operations budget for us to do what we do at the state level, the HHS and DHCS, what they do at the state level and state operations. And then there's two categories in there, local assistance and, um, for, the, for Cal OES and local assistance for um, Cal HHS. Local assistance for Cal OES is what we've been using to do all this 988 testing and technology and the uh, um, and the RFP we're working on for mobile dispatch, we're in the process of expending those funds and they've already been encumbered. Those of you that are accounting people know what that means. Encumbered means you've got a plan and, and authority to spend the money, so you've locked it up. Uh, invoiced means that you've actually spent that money, so that's where we are for OES. And in talking to DHCS, um, they've also encumbered that local assistance um, number through their current process, and, and they're in the process of distributing those funds to the centers. Uh, I don't know if they want to comment on where they are in the distribution process, but but um, I do know it's been encumbered as well. In other words, there's a plan in place for how to distribute it, and the, I don't know if the distribution has started. I don't know if anybody from HHS or DHCS wants to comment on that, but that's where we are. All right. Any other questions from either the board or the public on this item? Yes, one online. Matthew, go ahead. Hey, Budge, Matt Taylor, Dee Dee Hirsch. Um, I just wanted to comment on what you were saying about the consideration of the um, the fee, the surcharge, uh, whether there's a consideration of it in increasing from eight cents or not, and that uh, that process will be de uh, determined by October. Um, at what point, can you clarify at what point not only the existing 988 volume will be considered into that calculation, but also the um, estimated 911 diversion growth and the obligation to do outbound follow up calls um, and you know full coverage of chat and text. W will those additional components that are above and beyond current volume be factored into that analysis? So I can speak at length to the technology piece. The number that we've used for our call volume assumed a 200% of your current volume. So from a technology perspective, you can get, you know, twice as many calls as you're getting now without us changing anything on the technology side. And really it's a much larger number than that. It's probably a factor of at least 10. So we would not need to do anything on the technology side in order to accommodate that. The only changes we'd need is if additional centers are authorized, which which we aren't in the business of. That's really over in the HHS side. Uh, on the personnel side, there is a process that they're developing to gather that future state and what's needed. And I know those conversations are ongoing. The numbers you see on the screen do not reflect that because this is from 23-24, which is our current budget year. But I think, uh, Matt, to answer your question, those predictions will be factored into future funder funding years, and there's a process being worked on to develop that. And I don't know if anyone from um, any agency outside of OES wants to comment further on that, but I know that that those conversations are, ha are happening. Yeah, thanks from the perspective. Um, 
from the side of the call centers, it's really a question more about funding towards the personnel staff that are critical to answer those increased volume loads and outgoing expectations, much more than it is a concern about the technological capacity to handle the additional volume, because we're pretty sure you guys are, you know, programming that in. So um, I just want to always, you know, note that that those future growth projections in relation to staffing increases needed are absolutely critical relative to the KPIs that are expected of the centers. And um, D.D. Hirsch did, I think, as you know, um, uh, work with uh, the International Customer Management Association, ICMI, and all the centers this last fall to provide a three level, three, three year um, uh, volume growth projections and workforce growth projections models. And so we do hope that whichever entities and personnel are, are um, making these determinations of possible uh, fee increases that the analysis done in those ICMI models last fall with all 12 98 centers, uh, that those are considered. Thank you. Yeah, Matt, and I, I know I'm, I'm looking to uh, Dr. Bowie, she's probably not gonna comment, but, I will say this, Cal OES has the easy part here, and which is why we finished our part. Theirs is much, much more complex, um, and I know it's a, it's a work in progress. I don't know if you want to comment further, but. I can at high level, and the um, budget process is so complex. Um, the way that Cal HHS is, um, is, works is that we work to support the departments to implement the activities that they're required to do. So there are a number of state departments named in AB 988, DHCS, uh, DMHC, CDPH, Department of Insurance, which is not under umbrella, but our role as agencies to work with um, our state departments to ensure that they have both the authority and the resources they need to do to implement what's required of them in AB 988. Um, so, so there's like a kind of this two-fold process here. We don't yet have the full recommendation and the implementation plan that's going to come by September. Oh my goodness, I'm sweating as I'm saying that. Um, uh, but then the pro budget process is being worked out now, right? So there's a bit of a having to anticipate what the resources our departments will need in the coming year. So trust me, all those discussions are being are happening now, and we really, really work to make sure that there's both authority and funding resources to do what's needed to be done. Hopefully that's a good enough answer. <laughs> I think the shorter answer is Matt. Yes, your voice has been heard. Yes, we realize this is something that needs to be done. And I can tell you that whenever the budget questions come up, my phone rings. Uh, hey, what does this mean? And so we we are actively working through that process. So thank you for the feedback and the comment. We really appreciate it. All right, so uh, moving on then to agenda item number six, I'm going to turn the mic and the clicker over to Dr. Bowie, and she's going to run through some slides now. Um, there's quite a bit of, of material here, um, but a lot of it is going to be uh, for reference, and so she's going to run through this. So go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, let me just give you some uh, project highlights from Cal HHS in terms of the uh, policy advisor group and the work group. Um, we'll give you some updates and really highlight intersection in terms of the policy advisory group with this current technical advisory group. We'll um, review some draft recommendations that have already emerged from some of the work group just to highlight some of the issues that are being discussed and some next steps. A lot of this is referenced, as Baj mentioned. I covered AB 988 in the November meeting, so I don't think we need to go over that. Um, um, but let me just also uh, let you know that the complex project structure really highlights um, a statewide collaboration effort where Cal HHS seeks to bring together uh, many community uh, members and groups in these public facing um, advisory group meetings, as well as six work groups that are working through the detailed um, recommendation areas that AB 98 requires. And then we work very hard to communicate with our departments, um, the Behavioral Task Force, and certainly this 
technical advisory board in order to make sure that all conversations and um, concerns are um, uh, reviewed and um, and considered. Um, I think in terms of the work between the Cal HHS policy advisory group and this technical advisory board, it's crucial in the next several months that we have a very clear communication process so that we can, again, policy and technology do go hand in hand. So we appreciate the fact that there are a number of um, uh, members that sit on both boards, uh, as well as the very close collaboration that we have with Cal OES and this board to make sure that we align policy and technology together. Um, I do want to highlight the short timeline uh, that we have for this project. We are now in the middle of the slide in May of 2024. We have pretty much launched and almost completed the first three work groups. The next work groups are going to launch uh, uh, this month. We need to get a draft five year implementation plan together, and that will surface publicly in mid September. Um, we will have a robust public engagement process uh, in October. We'll come back and revise it at the last policy advisory group in November, and then we present the implementation plan to the state legislature in December. So uh, if you're interested, please keep up and provide us feedback. <laughs> and we will be working furiously for the next several months with probably very little sleep. All right. Um, some quick updates. Uh, you've seen these slides before in November. We are required by statute to have a particular departments and community members and organization represented on the policy advisory group. Um, we have an amazing advisory group that is incredibly hardworking and engaged. We have 43 members uh, who meet every other month. So a total of seven meetings over the course of one year, and we are all working very hard. So we deeply appreciate the expertise and the enthusiasm of this work group. I do want to highlight for you what are the policy advisory group meeting topics that we've been covered. So we've met three times already since December. Uh, we um, you know, grounded ourselves in the state vision that was outlined by the crisis care continuum plan. We worked on a comprehensive assessment for the crisis services system. That's not done yet, but we've got some pretty solid um, uh, data and statistics in terms of really looking at gaps uh, and uh, opportunities to build uh, a better crisis system. We have worked on a 988 standards guidance and technology, as well as the integration in terms of 988, 911, and the behavioral crisis care continuum. We look forward to um, working on data goals and metrics, as well as getting more information from uh, work groups on communication, on funding and sustainability. So the remainder of the year, you are definitely welcome to uh, join by Zoom or in person. Uh, the only exception to where the meeting will be held will be in August, because in August we need to be in Los Angeles near a beach. The rest of the time we're in Sacramento. So, <laughs> and um, I got the link to how you can join uh, through these meetings on Zoom uh, or information about how you can join in person. So we definitely welcome your input when you can. All right. Um, just a little bit of a quick dive into what the work groups cover because there are 14 required recommendation areas um, outlined by 988, uh, AB 988. We've divided them into six work groups. Um, I think you can see the titles of the work groups there. I'll be going over them in a bit more detail. So, um, you know, with no. I think I'll, I'll go, get into this in a little bit. I don't want to re read legislation to you. I just want to let you know that these work groups cover all the required 14 recommendation areas. Uh, in terms of process update, as I mentioned, the first three group groups almost finished. The last work group, and I want to highlight this, the integration work group, 911-988 and behavioral crisis care continuum, uh, will have one more meeting in July. They've already met three times, actually, sorry, four times. <laughs> but as you heard from today's discussion, integration is extremely complex. So we do need to get together at the end of July um, and we really, really want your input. 
um, I think the stuff that kind of surfaced in today's meeting. Um, and I know it's a little bit before you vote on the protocol of, of transfers, but I think your input and feedback into that work group will really help us. Okay. And then certainly the upcoming work groups, I want to highlight um, we're talking about communications in two meetings, how to communicate about 988 and 911 and what 988 does and doesn't do. Um, data and metrics in terms of how do we build a crisis system and measure how well we're doing. We're hoping to uh, get that done in, in a couple of meetings. And then we're going to plan three meetings on funding and sustainability to finish by August. We've also created a new work group for peers because there's a lot of uh, good work being done in terms of uh, peer workforce in the crisis care uh, space. Uh, and that work group is convening also over the summer. Um, I do want to highlight the very wonderful intersection of where technology and policy intersect. So the three um, required activities that this advisory board uh, does really correspond uh, well to the other work groups. So I just want to highlight where legislation really um, align. Um, and that's again for your reference. And if you were interested in any of the topics, uh, please feel free to attend those work groups. Okay. I think I do want to surface um, the comprehensive assessment was probably the most straightforward of the work group in terms of looking at gaps and needs across the system to inform resources and policy changes so that we can come together with a five-year implementation plan for comprehensive 9 system. system. Um, the, the inventory is pretty much almost done. We need some more work to be done. Uh, and then we're creating a chart book that provides a, a resource for reference um, now and in the future. And that will be forthcoming in the next few months. Uh, work group two uh, looks at statewide 98 standards and guidance. Um, so um, address a lot of things that would surface today in terms of infrastructure, staffing, and what training standards. And this is highlighting from a state-wide standpoint. There are, we know, national um, baseline standards. Uh, but we haven't had a chance to really outline what the state of California would like to see in terms of looking at 988 um, and what kind of core competencies would be needed so that a 988 can serve as a um, uh, entry point into a comprehensive crisis care system. All right. I don't think I need to go too far into it. Um, some draft recommendations that have already emerged would be the need for a state to define what uh, 98 centers currently do, and then what is the vision in the future uh, for uh, 98 centers in terms of a, a more comprehensive uh, behavioral health um, crisis entry point. Um, and certainly there's a lot of work to be done in that space. In terms of the integration effort, I think this will be of great interest to you. Uh, we really need to, again, complement the work in terms of the technology, what's possible, and then what policies do we need to set in place so that we can eventually get to the vision that we want. And I think I want to emphasize the five-year implementation plan. It's not going to happen overnight. Change will take time, resources, and thoughtful planning because we have a really good system now, but we don't want to overwhelm it. So the five-year implementation implementation plan will lay out what needs to be done in terms of clarity of um, authority, uh, what kind of um, uh, coordination we would need to, to set in place among many community and state implementation partners to make sure that we do this work thoughtfully and well. I do want to highlight um, this um, diagram that we're working on. And, and the reason why I'm doing this is that it lays out the different services and programs um, that are available to people contacting help. So this is not a, a visual from a help seeker standpoint. It's just from our state level standpoint about all the different parts of the system that we'll need to interrelate, coordinate, um, integrate. Um, and I think I want to highlight, for example, what we've been working on is the point B, right? The 911 to 988 and vice versa. 
transfer protocols and you saw how complex that is. So I just want to lay out the fact that all the diamonds, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, those are opportunities for us as a state to think about what are some baseline standards that we can set to make sure that those intersection points go well because that's where people fall in between the cracks is right when they move from one set of the one part of the system, one component of the crisis system to another. So I really want to emphasize the fact that this is an opportunity for us to think through as a state, what are some good baseline things, guidance that we can provide to make sure that people, uh, that we are uh, really kind of creating a, a more seamless system. I don't really think I need to um, read too much to you, um, but I just want to highlight some draft recommendations that have emerged and re was reviewed by the last policy advisory group in April in terms of, again, uh, highlighting the need for us to collaborate and coordinate across state, county, and local implementation partners. The need to think about what are some baseline standards for streamlined transfers. The need for us to think about the resources that we're going to need, the policies that we're going to need the protocols that we're going to need to make sure there's warm handoffs among the components of the system. How do we foster information exchanges between implementation partners so that we can ensure continuity of care uh, on individuals seeking help and, re and reduce the burden on them? Uh, so how do we really uh, monitor uh, the quality, the response times, and the follow-up to ensure that uh, individuals seeking help are connected to the right resources at the right time? And so I think that pretty much is it. Um, all the public notices, Zoom links, recordings, they're all at the website that I've got for you. Uh, and we look forward to your um, uh, advice, feedback, and um, encouraging words <laughs> in, in the near future. Thank you. Okay, so I think the first question I have, and then we'll clearly open it up to the board from here and then then to the public. Where do you need the most help and how can this be bo this board be most helpful? In other words, is there a particular working group where you've got a gap where we could maybe have some buddy that sits on this board or by extension, somebody this board knows that that they could uh, help fill in some gaps you're having um, would be my first question. Thank you. That's absolutely great. Um, work group three. We absolutely need some help um, because of the integration, right? 911988 and integration to the rest of the behavioral crisis care continuum. So, to the extent that you can help us with probably presenting to the policy advisory group either in August or September, the work that this board has been doing, I think that would really, really be helpful for us. Um, <laughs> No, no, I, I agree. I was going to get along the same way, and I, I think we need to be involved in, in that. So I'd. Um, um, well, I'm looking at Jennifer and Jeff because yeah. I think you both have been <laughs> yeah, that would be involved helpful. in that. I think they'd be helpful. I'd, yeah. I, I certainly have no ability to uh, make you do it, but if you have time, it would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, OK. Yeah, so uh, um, I think we'll reach out to you for better understanding of how we can prepare for that. The, the And you said the next meeting was July or August? The next meeting is in June. Well, I'm uh, talking about And four. then there's an August and a September. Let me talk to our team and talk to you okay. and, and align it. It's going to be in one of those <laughs> policy advisory group, but Perfect. we'll work that out. Thank you so okay. much for stepping up. OK, um, and then uh, just a general question, which I, I certainly don't want to open up the can of worms, but from the slides and all the conversations I've been in, I think the vision is that in California, those that are seeking to enter this continuum of care would the entry, the single entry point would be 988. Is, is that sort of what the vision is right now? Obviously, there's much work to be done before that becomes a reality, so please don't run off and say, wait, that's going to happen tomorrow. But I mean, is that sort of what the, your um, your policy board is considering that the entry point would be 988? I think there's different ways to say that. I think one way to say it would be when you are in crisis, it's pretty hard to remember all the different numbers that are possible out there to remember, right? 
uh, and we all know 911 now pretty easily. Um, so if there is a way that we can say, OK, yes, maybe if you have different numbers that you know by heart that you can connect to, I think that's awesome. But if you don't have any resources and you know that 988 is the resource, that seems to be an easy three digit number for everyone to remember, right? So I think that makes sense. Yeah, and the reason why I asked that is because obviously that drives some capacity questions that a lot of the centers are probably thinking right now. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. But it's important to consider, especially at this point in the plan, also some upstream activities that are happening at the federal level that could, if you call 988 and have to go through a, a, a tree and you hit the wrong option and you don't end up in California, that could be something else. The geo routing stuff that we're talking about becomes very important. Um, so we know there's some limitations to that, but I think that 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 frames our conversation when we realize that that easy to remember number is something that that's being considered. So, OK, thank you. Those were my couple of questions. I'm going to open it up to the board. Um, this was very comprehensive. Thank you. And really, this is just the tip of the work that the group over at HHS has been doing. Um, it's been amazing to see how much energy and detail you've put into this process so far so thank you i, I just want to comment that uh sorry i did have one more ask of this board uh in terms of um the baseline i think funding and sustainability there's a lot of questions that may emerge and we may need some help we already have some awesome recording and presentation from you but about the the fee surcharge and how that fund is distributed i think uh, to the extent that we can elucidate that for um, our community members and policy advisor group, we may need to tap you for that part as well. I'm looking at Paul Troxel, who's our 911 branch manager. Hey, buddy, how are you? Um, so I'm thinking uh, you or Theo uh, would would be good for that. Um, just down in, down in the weeds conversation. Yeah. Uh, just on a comment about a, about the comments that you made earlier about the entry um, but but an entry point locally in County Santa Clara, 98 is the local is is the entry point for services or behavioral related related services. Yeah, and that's that's what we're seeing is that um, the desire is to have this single entry point, um, but right now we know there's some challenges in how you navigate the current system to get to that local help and that's really what we're focused on is to try and make it as easy as possible that when you're in help you re you need help you remember the number to call to get help and when you call that number it gets you to the right place to provide you the resources and and um you know that's the vision that that we're all embracing and i know that in conversations with samsa and uh, the lifeline administrator that's what they're focused on as well so we all have the same desire outcome it's just um, a lot of moving parts to make that a reality absolutely all right any other comments from the board okay comments from the public on uh, agenda item number six okay all right thank you for that and these slides will be made available uh there's a tremendous amount of information in them and uh, having personally developed presentations like this there was a lot of work that went in to make it this concise so Please take advantage of that information. All right, we've got time left um, and I've got a couple more important agenda items yet to go. Agenda item number seven is normally a very, um, we just hit this quick and move on with the FCC and, and Vibrant updates. However, uh, since we last met, um, as we were contemplating our letter to the FCC to encourage them to you know, start the proposed rulemaking process for geo routing. Well, they have done that. And so the letter that we carefully crafted was extremely effective because we didn't even need to send it and it happened. So good job to everybody uh, for the work that you did in considering that. So this hyperlink, which is available uh, through the uh, website, um, will take you directly to the notice of proposed rulemaking. I think it's 30 some pages. And the way this works is this document is live and out there and available, but it's not official until it hits the federal registrar, which it has not done yet. We anticipate that happening soon. When that happens, there's 30 days to make comments. And then there's another 60 days to make 
from the original start date, in other words, 30 days after the comments, the comments of the comments are due. All of that information is gathered together by the FCC. Then they develop rules that they then publish and vote on via one of their meetings. And that process will take six to 18 months, depending on how many comments and how complex this is. This particular notice of proposed rulemaking is very unique because they didn't actually include proposed rules. Normally they include an addendum that says, here's the proposed rules we're considering. That's not in this one, which is different. So I would expect that the comment phase is going to get very interesting as people contemplate what the proposed rules should or shouldn't be. And then we go through another iteration. So I'm the, all of that to say, it's going to take some time before this is done. Loud and clear, the message has been received that somewhere we need to make clear that even when 988 geo routing is in place, we still have no idea where you are when you call 988 and we don't know who you are. And so we want to make sure that that is absolutely clear in everything that we're doing. All this is trying to do is when you call 988, instead of using your area code to determine the center, we use a better method of routing you to the right 988 center. There are two schools of thoughts in the routing, and I want to take this as a takeaway to all of you for homework as to what we're going to do. Option one that is in the rules is you call 988, we take your location that the carrier knows, this is for obviously for wireless calls, right? And we compare that to a legacy data set that lists wireline switching centers, which have a small geographic area. I think there's a, maybe a thousand of them in the entire country. So from that location, we now know generally where you are, we'll get you to the right 988 center much better than if we just used your area code. I have a 916 area code. When I'm in DC and call 988, which is a likely scenario, um, then that call would come back to California when really potentially the help I need might be in DC and you'd want it routed locally because that's where I'm physically at. So it overcomes that, that barrier, all right? Then it sends that call into the vibrant system and then it's using some of the old legacy telephone type mechanisms to do the routing stuff, which is which is a recommendation that the testing that's referenced in the geo routing proposal includes. Other ways to do, do it that I have heard um, discussed are we leverage the 911 like, and I'll say it's like because it doesn't tell you who you are, or where exactly you're at, but we use a more of a geo routing scenario. We know the tower that your cell phone came into, that's known, still doesn't tell where you are, right? There's in the cell tower we're in right now, there's probably 50,000 people in that same cell sector. So it doesn't really tell me where you are. But from there, we do geospatial routing based on the boundaries of all the 200 plus 98 centers in the country. Again, another known piece of data. And we just route you geospatially on that to the right 98 center. The advantage of that proposal is it's more future proof than the first one. And I, I expect you'll hear both of them in the comments and pros and cons of each and everything. So that's what I expect from this process based on the conversations that I've had with those that are tracking this pretty close. So I'll pause there for questions on that and kind of what this is about. And then the next question would be for the board, what do you want to do about all that? So first, go so ahead. Just to, to clarify, you're saying those are the two options they're looking at, or they're saying that would be a choice that we would have? We don't know the proposed rules because they weren't written. Okay. But the first of those two is what the test that was completed demonstrated. Right. Again, a, a dramatic improvement to what we have now. Yeah, and I agree with your comment. The geospatial routing would be better for future changes as 911 or uh, sorry, 988 centers increase in deployment. We, you know, throughout the state or throughout the country it would it would already be baked in and and make it easier to not have to do later adjustments. Yeah. And again, neither of those two high level overviews I gave tell you exactly where you are 
or who you are when you call. They, they both work the same. One is more of a tabular data set that's based on a static set of data that exists today. The other one is more dynamic and can flex in the future and aligns more to what the carriers are doing to support 911 and, and other technologies. So yeah. All right, other questions on that? Okay, so oh, uh, go ahead. The, thanks for going through that. I think it's actually very interesting. Based on your knowledge of the California's geography or the infrastructure that PCEPs already have in place, is there significant advantages or disadvantages to, to one of those that would be specific to California versus maybe what other states are looking at? Yes, yeah, so because we have 12 centers and some states have one, right? Arizona has one. So their routing is rather rudimentary compared to ours. So yeah, there are some advantages to us if we go in the more geospatial realm because as new centers come up, it's easy to build a new boundary. It's not complex, provide it to all the carriers and we could take advantage of that. Um, however, our platform we're building can very easily ingest that data and do the routing. And there might be some other limitations to technologies that are out there that you'll need like an interim step. Like here's the geospatial way to do this. Oh, well, you can't read that. That's fine. Here's the correlating data that we can deliver to your system in another state that doesn't have a geospatial capability that'll still get the call to the right place. So there's a way to facilitate both. Um, and it, it's just, a we, since we haven't seen the rules, in general, the FCC rules and don't dictate a technology or a vendor or whatever, they, they, they require a mechanism and a accuracy level. So I would expect that's kind of what they're gonna do, but I don't know, all this is speculative at this point. So, and if I could expand on that too, the geospatial routing, it would present uh, other opportunities for us. So not just getting it to the right 988 center, but then also making it so that the 988 center could know what other services would be available in that area. So that whether that be mobile crisis response teams or uh, public safety uh, resources, whatever it may be. Yeah, so if we, you've got a system in place that maps services available, Geospatially, like if you, you know, Dr. Wick is on 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 the line. There's what 120 different PSAPs she's supporting. I don't know how many counties. Is it 20 different counties? So you know, so being yeah, able lot. to know, yeah, it's a a lot. Thank you, a lot. <laughs> so being able to know, okay, this is geographically here, not correlating it to some wire center boundary, which may or may not really make much sense. But you know, oh, it's here. Well, in this area, this is what's available there. That matches to all the other technologies we're building. Um, so yeah, there, there probably is an advantage there, but we wanna be mindful that this is not just about California. Our comments have to be able to be implemented everywhere, even if we might be a, a little bit farther ahead in one area than not. And that'll be the real, the real challenge for us is to make sure that whatever we're doing uh, doesn't alienate anybody. We wanna make sure that everybody gets access to, to good services regardless of where they are. All right, any other comments? All right, any comments online? Go ahead. Uh, who's online? Oh, Dr. Wick, go ahead. Yeah, I had a question. Um, so you're talking about just the initial routing in this. Um, that's what this context is yes. about, right? Yes. So because the geospatial routing is different than if we have to do a backtrace and really get into the micro about where the individual is in a life-threatening situation yes dr wick that's exactly right so the question okay. is you call 988 we geospatially route you to the right center it's now determined to be 911 we don't magically know where you are all we know is we've probably got you to the right center right so then from there you have to go through exigent circumstance and there's a whole nother working group that's trying to automate that process to make it faster but the exigent circumstance that's used to work with the carrier to get your exact location would still be in place because when the call arrives at the center is all we know is you're likely at the correct center and that's it we don't know anything else other than you're we've improved the ability to get you the right center but with that if we got it to the right 988 center 
they're more likely to be interacting with a PSAP or the local law enforcement agency that they need to. Exactly. If we know geospatially you're at the right center, then we would also know, hey, this is the right 911 center for you to work with. So there are some workflows that dramatically improve just with that first step. Absolutely. Yeah. So can, can I add to that, that that would be a yes and no, right? Because if our centers that cover most, if not all of Northern California, um, it doesn't quite tell me which PSAP to call in all of Northern California, right? So, but um, to follow up on that comment, um, we do ask people and they typically tell us, not always, uh, but most callers um, or a good majority um, are, are more than happy to tell us where they're at or at least what county they're in. Um, when we start talking to them about um, resources, you know, that's just resources are safe. Uh, interventions and voluntary versus involuntary is a different conversation, but um, resources, we those are very open and voluntary. We just ask them, you know, what city or county they're in. And we look the resources up based on that. PSAP, so in a broad area like all of Northern California, I'm not yet hearing how that's going to be helpful. I think it'll de depend on how the geo routing is delivered. If if we are able to get the cell sector, then we can tell you in almost every case, 80% of the case, what PSAP that would correlate to. So I think a lot will depend on how the rules are written and what the carriers deliver. And again, even if we know the cell tower that you're affiliated with, I still don't know where you are, right? There's a, yeah. And I think that's the risk here is that we have to balance the the strong desire we all have collectively, 911, 988, everybody in this space to respect the fact that 988 is anonymous and we don't know where you are. We we want that to be preserved, but we need to know generally where you are so we can get you to the right services to match your request. And, and so that's kind of the balance we're trying to have. So how we word that will be, just be important. Yeah. And so just one more clarifying question. So, um, I guess I'm really, I really want this to be the best tool. Um, and we have a PSAP uh, locator with Vibrant currently, but the way this new with the new FCC ruling and the new geospatial ability that we're talking about here, that improves on that tool because it's not it's not based on the area code of the phone any longer, which Vibrant is. It's based on where the person actually is, correct? That's correct. And the technology that we are trying desperately to deploy to you takes it one step further because all of those PSAPs are automatically known the minute that that you get into the system. So in other words, in today's yeah. world, 98 call comes and you say, hey, what county are you in? I'm in Nevada County. We automatically know in the 911 system how to get the call from 98 to 911 in Nevada County with you just clicking a button that says Nevada County. And so that's what we want to work toward. This would allow us to get one step closer to that because now we've gotten the original call to the right center. In your case, Dr. Wick, you have such a large area that's not as helpful, but for other parts of the state, it's extremely helpful. So yes, this is okay, a yeah. dramatic improvement on that. Yep, you're absolutely right. Yes, All right. thank you. Absolutely. Okay, any other questions online about this? Okay, so now, what does the board want to do about this? Because we only have 30 days when it hits the registrar. If we're if we do anything as a board, we have to meet publicly, you have to have a special meeting, and I have to get all that moving now. So does the board want to try and put in comments as a board? There's a process for that. Um, is there some other mechanism? You know, open discussion for the board um, to set what you want to do. What would the recommendation from Cal OES be? I don't think we're allowed to recommend. That's what I was just asking. I'm just pulling the interest and you make a recommendation and we'll see what we can do with it. This board does have the ability to meet as a special meeting um, that doesn't require obviously Cal OES approval. Like that, that's not required. It's part of the public okay. meeting act request, but we'd all have to commit that like in 
three weeks, we're going to get together again, which is pretty fast for us. And then we have to have quorum in person and yeah. So when people make comments is very public, like who's making the comment? Uh, yeah. Do you generally see a lot of working groups like this making comments on rulemaking? No, because of how cumbersome it is for the group to get together and make said comments. Okay. However, um, we could go more informal. I have not talked to OES leadership. I do not know if we're going to be submitting comments. I have no idea. But obviously the board could say, hey, if we were to comment, this is what we would be interested in. That would be helpful. Um, I, I cannot say whether Cal OES is going to comment or not. I, ju I just don't know. Okay. I don't really have a, I really don't have an opinion either way. I feel like I want to read the document and I'd be happy to comment on my own. Okay. For, you know, representing my center. And and for those centers, 911 centers that do want to comment individually, I do know of some resources that can help you understand how to comment. It's not that hard. But that would be great. Yeah, and I can connect you with that. So if there's anybody okay. that wants that, that it's I don't know. I think they might be willing to help 98 centers too, but I know for 911 centers that's what it's set up for. Um, but if you want to learn how to make an FCC comment, it's not that hard um, of a process, provided you can get your local approval to make said comment. But individuals can make comments too. That's allowed, just like this meeting. Anybody can show up and make a comment, and it's totally allowed. Yep. Well, I I would propose to the group if there's interest, then we would have the quorum. I, I would support a special meeting to do that because I know this topic was important enough to us that we drafted the letter, we we made an agenda item, virtually every meeting I can think of. So uh, that's that's what I would suggest to the group if there is enough interest and we could get the quorum to hold the special meeting. The, the question I would have, Budge, is since timing is super important here, do you think that's still within reason to schedule a special meeting and all that? Assuming that the stars align and everybody can make it and that kind of thing. It it It's going to be challenging. Uh, admittedly yeah so i mean i i my thoughts are if we can make that happen with those challenges acknowledged i i still think it would be worthwhile i agree with jeff um oh sorry go ahead i i'm interested to find out if, well, whether this board can make a formal endorsement of through whatever process through even through um a collective comments and so on, uh, rather than a letter of support. Um, so, yes, but that would still require an in-person quorum meeting to even do that. So that's possible as well, but we still have to meet as a board in order to formally endorse. Go ahead. With the period that we anticipate of the the secondary comment period, like the comment of the comments, would that be a, like a reasonable option where we then would have some more information to work off of, as well as some more time to make the scheduling happen? Yeah, that is another um, opportunity. We could we could look out. We we know when when this hits the registry, the 30 day clock starts, but the 60 day clock starts too, right? So the, both clocks start simultaneously. So we could look to prior to the 60 day clock to then wait for the comments to be posted and then comment on the comments. Um, so that's another strategy and that might coincide very closely with the August meeting since it still hasn't hit the registrar yet. So that is an option as well. I don't know that that timing will work out exactly with the meeting we have set, but it certainly will be close to that time frame. I guess my next question is, is it possible to if our that meeting day in August needs to be moved a week? That yes, we can move it. Calendar? Yeah, we certainly can move that meeting. Um, the only thing is, again, we need quorum and we need advance notice. And so I'm looking at Paul. I mean, are we close to 60 days from that next one? No, it's May. We're about 90 days. Yeah.
Yeah, we basically have to know kind of today. So, yeah, but we we could certainly do that. We could aim to comment on the comments, essentially. Yeah. And I could get more clarity to the board um, and adjust the August meeting date so that that's possible. So that we do that all at once, if that's the recommendation. Um, I can't tell you what that date would be right now because I don't want to hit the registrar. And the other piece I don't know is if the 60 day comment window from the original posting in the registrar is adjustable. But I know it's 60 days, but I don't know if there's so many. Do they extend it and blah, blah, blah? Because that's the other thing that sometimes happens is people comment to say, wait a minute, because you didn't even post the proposed rules, you know, we need more time to even get our comments in. And then the FCC changes all the dates and then we're, we're, we're chasing a moving target. So, yeah, that, but. That's possible as well. The other opportunity you would have is the associations you represent, the agencies you represent. You could certainly comment through them, right? There's nothing stopping you from doing that, provided you don't establish an inadvertent quorum to develop the comments to then post, because then we would be in violation of a serial meeting. So you can't have seven of us. Uh, all together as you have those discussions. All right, so not hearing any motions for any changes at this point. We'll continue to move forward. Certainly anything that you submit to us as Cal OES, if we did any comments, we would value your input. And if um, if you want to submit anything to us, we will certainly be willing to take a look at that. Um, so please think this through, any thoughts you have, any high level things that are important from either a clinical perspective, a 98 perspective, a call flow perspective, or the 911 side, uh, the 911 perspective and, and the importance of this and moving calls back and forth between the two and how geo routing is important. Help us understand any of that that you can. And um, if we did make comments, we certainly would be able to use that information. Yeah. Yeah. So if you do send anything to us to Cal OES, there's no guarantee that we will submit that to the FCC, right? Just, we're not committing to anything, but, you know, if nothing else, it'll help inform the conversation at the next meeting. Um, just so you, if you're not familiar with the FCC process, there is something called an ex parte. An ex parte is where you meet individually with the FCC outside of the comment period or in conjunction with the comment period to um, tell them this is something to help inform the record as you make this. And we will have over the next year to do that. So it could be something that this board says, hey, we couldn't make the comment period. We couldn't make the comment to the comment period, but here's an ex parte letter that we've generated as a board that helps inform the record to get on the record as part of the filing to help in inform the rules. That's available too. So don't think you've got like a one, like. This is your only time to do this, and I know it's complicated. I'm trying not to make it complicated, but it's it's the federal government. This is their process. I'm just it's just what it is. OK, all right. That's that's where we are, so be careful. You might just get what you ask for. Remember, we asked for a rulemaking. We got a rulemaking. Here we go. <laughs> all right, um, and I already gave the update on Vibrant there. Um, you know, we're working with them to to finalize this and, and really want to thank them and, and Sam still for the partnership on this and really been working in close collaboration with them. Really appreciate that. Um, all right. Any other comments or feedback on item number seven? Any other comments from the public on item number seven? All right. Seeing, hearing none. Agenda items for future meetings. So this is where you probably should consider what we want to do in August. So. Um, I think we're leaning toward voting on that policy that the 911 to 988 working group is is uh, is doing. So that's uh, that's an agenda item. I'll add that. Policy document for the or I'd say guideline document is probably really what what it's more like. Guideline document for 911 to 988. Um, transfers. 
anything else that you want to specifically call out? And this is really looking towards something you want to specifically have on the agenda that we might need to vote on um, and take action on for the next meeting. Is the geo routing item if we do review and vote on comments that that's already in the standing agenda, so we don't need to add it or we should probably add it as a stand, standing item. So I'll, I'll put that I'll put action to be determined what that action is on 988 geo routing. Proceeding. OK, you can certainly put that on anything else anyone's thinking. Anything else you're hearing out there that we, we just don't have incorporated yet that you think we should talk about? You you had brought up the, I don't know if it needs to be an agenda item, they're talking about the, the, the question of um, dispatch responsibilities for mobile crisis response. Is that something that we, Probably around that time that we need to start discussing that. Probably, yeah. yeah, I think that should be an agenda item. Right, dispatch responsibilities or something, something like that. Yeah, for. I need eight MDS and that's just I'm basically starting the conversation. Yeah, so that's be thinking that over as well in your minds. Um, and obviously it has to tie closely with the implementation plan for, for sure. But I think this board from a technology perspective, what are the implications of that? And, and yeah, go ahead. And that's timely because the August 14th policy advisory group will have that set of like a draft implementation plan and, and at least some getting close to the final recommendation. So I think we should highlight whatever intersects with the policy, with the technology to bring to this board. That makes sense. Okay, perfect. All right, anything else from the board members? All the updates that you mentioned earlier, are those like standing items, the, those, updates? Okay. Yeah, the standard agenda you saw here will, will stay the same. Yeah, right. absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious to hear more about the SAMHSA approval process and when it's happening, <laughs> so yeah. I'm considering, uh, yeah. Yeah, and by August, the, the budget's been approved as well, and the fund condition statement is out, so that conversation will be in the open for the next year and, and what all that looks like as well. Don't miss the August board meeting, I guess is what we're saying. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> OK, all right. Seeing, hearing none there. Um, move on to public comment. So we'll start with the board. Anything that wasn't on the agenda that, that you want to comment on that, that we didn't already talk about? All right, open it up to I, members of up. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Wick. Was that you? Yeah, it was. Um, this is gonna, I think this could be my last board meeting. Um, because I'm I'm leaving Wellspace after uh, June 30th. Um, so I just want to say it's been really a pleasure working with you all on this uh, board. And um, I really enjoyed my time here. I can follow up with you um, privately about, you know, process for that. and. Um, I, let, I let Samantha know, um, but I'm not, I'm not sure what the process is for um, how and when you find um, a replacement. All right, so Samantha, you didn't authorize that, did you? I don't remember authorizing that. <laughs> I don't know if I can continue. Can I continue after I'm out of world space? I don't know how that goes. Yeah, pro probably not, so thank I, you. I, Think uh, for your service. Yeah. I, I mean, seriously, um, the partnerships that we have and the, the conversations we have, the reason why this board is successful is because of the time you all are willing to put into this and and the expertise that you bring. And certainly, Dr. Wick, your expertise and, and insights have been extremely valuable. So, uh, yeah, we'll connect offline. We'll see what that looks like and, and how we move forward on that. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. OK, any other uh, comments from the board? I have a question um, at a previous meeting that you were able to give us updates on like how many calls were being answered specific to California and like even comparing that kind of response time and things to other states. Um, some of that information is on SAMHSA's website, but not all of it. And so I think that would be kind of interesting for us to hear about how that's going. And if you happen to have any 
right now, just as we kind of compare the numbers of how many, what call volume is like in California. It has been very useful. I use some of those numbers in some of my me meetings where I can explain, well, actually California has a significant call volume and what's actually this significant. It's more than any other state. And one of the numbers you gave last time, it's more than 26 other com states combined. They go, wow, California is really doing something. And so then they pay more attention. Yeah, so what I'll do for the, the updates that we give uh, as part of Cal OES, I'll include those metrics uh, in there. We can do that. The only question I have, and we'll have to follow up, and, and I don't know if, if um, Dr. Boo, you know the answer to this, but the, the broad state metrics that are broken out by center on 988, are those shareable publicly or not? And you don't have to answer that now, but that'll be part of the metric. When we generate our own metrics, we will be able to share whatever, you know, obviously from the centers, we'll talk to you, but, um, you know, we, we can certainly share some data at a high level. We have to be very careful that we don't um, inadvertently um, point out a, a, something that's perceived as not good related to a specific center. That's the only thing. So we'll probably keep it at state level, how calls are moving around and stuff and provide that level of metrics. Um, certainly, All right? Absolutely, we can do that. Okay. All right, any uh, comments from uh, members of the public? for items that weren't on the agenda. Go ahead, sir. Step on up to the mic here. Thanks. Hi there, I'm Robert Bennett. Um, uh, I work for, um, oh, sorry, I got to start again. Robert Bennett, VP and Technology Advisor for WorkManage. Um, my job for the past 25 years has been wireless 911 call routing at the at the carrier level. So I understand at the at the one and zero level how those calls work. Um, a lot of what you're talking about with 911 to 988 handovers and with 988 geolocation have a huge impact on how the wireless carriers send you the calls, whether they send them as an emergency or as a non-emergency call. Um, Many of the features that you're talking about are just not available if they if the carrier sends them to you as a non-emergency call. So there's an education level that I think the board, the members of the board could benefit from. And so I just want to let everybody know that I'm making myself available to the board members to discuss the technical aspects of how 911 or emergency calls and non-emergency calls leave a wireless carrier and come into your networks and how you can use that information to further either your comments to the FCC or in, in defining how you're going to move forward with the work you're doing here. Yeah, thank you. I know that's a complex landscape, so we appreciate the comment. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Absolutely. All right, any other questions online or in the room from uh, from the public? All right. Seeing none, move on to agenda item number 10, which is adjournment. Um, so we're right on time. We we increased this meeting to two and a half hours. It's exactly at that time hack right now. So I think we've uh, established a, a good workflow. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Oh, uh, motion from Aaron and a second from. I second from Jennifer. All right, we stand adjourned. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your time and look forward to our next meeting. Thank you.